All right, well, welcome everybody. Um, we're really grateful for just how many of you have shown up to what is the last listed session of the uh, of this incredible conference. And I don't know about the rest of you, but I've been at quite a few sessions and they have been really, really uh, wonderful. Today's session is on public health and environmental peace building, linkages and lessons. And we know that that you know, a, a healthy functioning environment, functioning ecosystems, you know, reliable, fair access to natural resources, resilience in the face of environmental stress and shock are all closely intimately related to public health. We know that for years, since, uh, since the Lancet magazine started its climate countdown, there's been tremendous amount of very compelling research about the multiple linkages between environmental health and public health. We also know that environmental peace building takes stock of situations where infrastructure has been destroyed, livelihoods have been upset. Um, it tries to assess damage, kickstart projects to restore ecosystem functions, um, improve natural resource management, and, and, and develop priorities around the environmental and climate agenda. These activities clearly have significant implications for public health in conflict affected areas and peace building countries. The presentations for this, um, for this session, and we have two of them, really sort of dive into some of the key challenges the environmental peace building community faces um, when, it, when it is trying to uh, address what are often pervasive and extensive environmental problems in, in conflict affected places that have huge implications for you know, improving public health and creating the conditions for, make, for restoring public health where in, in places where it's often faced significant setbacks. Um, what I'm gonna do is just remind people that we have a code of conduct, a code of conduct and an uh, anti-harassment policy that we'll post in the chat if you haven't yet seen them, but I think at the end of the conference, you probably have seen them. Um, the presenters are going to each present for a few minutes. Um, we have enough time to give them if, anywhere between 10 to 12 minutes um, of time. The, our discussant will raise a number of questions and make comments. Um, they'll respond, we'll open it up to questions and answers. So at any time, if you have a clarifying question, just drop it into the chat. Um, other questions, put them in the chat as you think of them, and we'll try and run through them and get to as many as we can uh, before the closing comments in an hour and a half. So let me begin by just welcoming our, our, our panelists, and I'm going to say a little bit about, about each one of them um, uh, just before they present. Uh, Hadil Hamoud is a Duke University student um, studying political science and international comparative politics with a concentration on the Middle East. She's uh, she focuses on refugee resettlement, geopolitics of migration, and environmental peace building in the Middle East North Africa region. She's conducted research on the medical brain drain in Egypt uh, for Eco Peace uh, Middle East on its global education program. And she's also carried out research on US diplomatic foreign policy for conflict resolution um, at Duke University. Sam El Mahdi is a, also a Duke University student uh, studying global health and psychology. Her research interests uh, lie in the area of addressing health disparities, especially as they relate to refugee and resettled populations. She has also conducted research on medical brain drain in Egypt um, and worked on the Duke Kennan refugee research team to address COVID related issues within the Durham, that's in North Carolina refugee community. And she's also carried out research on parenting activity practices across cultures and their impact on child well-being and development. They will present first their paper on examining access to WASH, so that's water uh, sanitation hygiene systems, during COVID-19 in Egypt and Sudan. So I don't know the order you want to speak in or if you have slides, but you are co host so please take it away, Sama and Hadil. Yes, thank you so much. I'm just giving me a moment to share my screen. Um, There we go. Um, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, yes, my name is Hadil Hamoud, and I'm a senior at Duke University. Um, 
and my colleague Sema is also a senior at Duke University and we are presenting our research the bridge focused on examining COVID-19 resilience building mechanisms implemented among Wash humanitarian actors in Egypt and Sudan and for context um, to, just to position ourselves um, I'm Sudanese American and Sudan is er, and Sema is uh, Egyptian American. Yeah so um, I think first of all before we get started we're just going to a little context for the wash needs that are in Egypt and Sudan currently. Um, so for Egypt, there's, when it relates to water, 7.3 million people are deprived of access to safe water, among which 5.8 million live in rural areas and 1.5 million in urban areas. Um, as of 2014, 91% of the Egyptian population received water directly to the residences. Um, and then in terms of sanitation, 8.4 million people are deprived of access to improved sanitation, but this is mostly in rural areas. And so the focus when it comes to Egypt is really on the rural communities, because um, Egypt in the last decades has made significant progress in terms of like direct access to safe drinking water at the household level and basic sanitation services. So, um, but like when it comes to many villages in rural area, in rural Egypt, that can, they, they continue to rely on water delivery delivery and um, waste disposal systems that are like outdated and um, unhygienic and therefore extremely unsafe. And there's an estimated 89% of households um, in urban areas that are covered by public sewer, but compared to only 37% in rural areas. Um, so only 6% of Egyptian villages are provided without wastewater treatment services um, that the urban areas all seem to be um, receiving. Um, when it comes to Sudan, um, the access to drinking water varies from 30% in North Darfur to 95% in Khartoum. Um, and there's a significant impact for children. 11% of child deaths in Sudan are caused by diarrhea, which is attributed mainly to poor sanitation, water, um, and hygiene. And 2 million children in Sudan suffer from acute malnutrition, so 50% of which is associated with repeated diarrhea or um, worm infections. Um, water and sanitation related diseases are one of the leading causes of death for children under five in Sudan. Um, and in terms of sanitation, 26% of people nationally in Sudan are reported to practice open defecation, which is the highest rate in the Middle East and North Africa region. And um, two thirds of schools don't have improved sanitation facilities and one fourth don't have access to clean water. Um, so from there, we like once COVID hit, like Kadil and I both um, like really wanted to like, take a look at how COVID was going to be impacting the the existing wash structures that were in Egypt and Sudan. And so that caused us to um, come up with these research questions. So one, um, our research seeks to understand how COVID-19 has affected existing efforts by humanitarian actors to expand the capacities of the wash sector, um, illuminate how the pandemic has fostered new interventions while also identifying opportunities for building resilience, um, especially among among humanitarian actors serving these refugee populations. Um, so the purpose is to really offer guidance for supporting sustainable and resilient peace building efforts through illustrating the connections between WASH and peace building. Um, and then for our methodology and approaches, um, we started out by conducting a review of the existing literature on the WASH service provision in resilience building in both Egypt and Sudan. We wanted to really get a better understanding of the information that was um, available in order to better inform our study and determine how our study could really fill the gaps in the existing literature. Um, we found a lot of really interesting studies and papers um, from both like Egyptian authors and Sudanese authors and also um, like international um, aid studies. Um, and we're able to really conduct some in really um, informative informational interviews with these authors and it really um, so that they, they provided like a lot of valuable insight into conducting our OCD and structuring it as well. Um, and from there we were able to um, conduct uh, interviews with experts that um, were just employees who worked um, with with different humanitarian um, organizations on the ground in Egypt and Sudan. So the interview questions centered around the organization's existing um, interventions, the impact of COVID on these interventions, the organization's response mechanisms to the crisis, and um, how COVID-19 has fostered new interventions in the country as well. So for Sudan, we were able to talk to several individuals, um, including the WASH sector coordinator for UNICEF in Sudan and the head of the WASH um, program for UNHCR as well. And then for Egypt, we were able to talk to um, the World Bank um, Water Division lead. Um, so yeah, so we were able to get a lot of really good information from them.
Yeah, so um, we had a lot of data available to us. And so we grounded our study um, in uh, cons different, uh, in our definition of what resilience meant and um, in definitions of resilience and vulnerability. So we defined resilience as the ability for a system to anticipate or recover from adverse shocks or crises. So in this case, the COVID-19 pandemic would be the crisis or shock to wash um, international humanitarian wash service prov providers. Um, and in conducting our interviews, we also encountered more expansive uh, definitions of resilience, which included not only for a system to bounce back or recover from an initial shock, but actually sustainably develop or progress from it or bounce forward, um, as one interviewee put it. Um, so this kind of relates to a little bit, uh, a more innovative um, approach to resilience building. Um, and this kind of conceptual framework uh, is taken from a study conducted um, by the International Institute for Environment and Development in coordination with UNICEF and the Water and Sanitation for the Urban Poor. And this framing we, we was used in our study to ground our analysis of the international humanitarian WASH service providers. Um, they had a particular emphasis on equity, sustainability, and resource efficiency. But then in our study, I think we intervened by also um, looking at peace building and the potential for peace building when responding to COVID-19 shocks. Um, and so conceptualizing vulnerability, um, in our study, we're defining vulnerability as the state of susceptibility to harm from exposure to shocks and stresses and from the absence of the capacity to adapt. Um, so in terms of Egypt, um, in Egypt, so the major vulnerability facing Egypt's wash systems pre-COVID is that um, of developing and better managing the very limited natural resources of water to meet the needs of the growing population. Um, so like as the, the current infrastructure as it stands, including both sewage and drinking water systems, can't really help but lag behind the pace of the population growth in many areas. So causing a lot of like untreated sewage problems, which leads to serious contamination of drinking water supply. Um, and when it comes to Sudan, um, Sudan's facing multiple emergencies, including record flooding, intercommunal clashes in Darfur and Ethiopian refugee influx in uh, the Eastern part of Sudan. Um, there's also governance challenges like relating to the coup and just instability with um, government, which reduces the avail availability of government support and resources to um, improving wash access. And there's also um, issues with climate change um, in Sudan, which is increasing um, extreme water events. And um, there's a, um, an, a, like a water shortage um, existing in the country as well. Um, and looking at the initial impacts of COVID-19 on like global wash systems, um, there were measures taken by governments to contain the pandemic led to widespread disruption in the provision and financing of essential services, but governments were uh, still introduced measures to keep wash services running. So 119 to 124 million people pushed into extreme poverty um, um, as a result of the pandemic, which exacerbated the need for wash services. And um, as well, COVID disrupted the collection and some created a demand for new data um, which, which caused like an emergence of new data sources. Um, and thus like international humanitarian actors faced um, decreased internal capacities due to sa staff safety concerns and equipment shortages as a result of the um, pandemic. So taking a little bit of a closer look at how humanitarian actors in Sudan responded um, to the shocks of the pandemic, um, this kind of gives a little bit of a timeline or a conceptual framing for how actors are supposed to respond. Um, there's this initial stage of relief, um, just dealing with the crisis in the short term. And then we have these stabilization and development phases in which actors um, begin implementing interventions that are focused on more structural changes um, and addressing structural issues. So um, in Sudan, um, there was an initial, our, like from our interviews, we found that there was an initial focus on mass distribution and staff protection. Um, and barriers to this included panic buying of materials, which led to um, supply shortages, um, as well as supply chain issues and pr other procurement issues in Sudan. 
Um, there was also an initial heavy emphasis on hand washing as a response mechanism, and this was building off of existing interventions that both UNICEF and UNHCR were already implementing in Sudan, um, in, in the refugee camps in Sudan. Um, so the one of the first goals was to increase the hand washing number of hand washing facilities to reduce overcrowding. And then the third major initial response was um, training the staff on COVID-19 protocols. There was a lot of confusion at the beginning um, in terms of how to deal with COVID in particular. So um, they relied on uh, UNHCR staff in particular relied on online trainings from the uh, um, higher level administrative officials to better understand the virus. Um, so there was a little bit of a waiting period to get that guidance. And um, we, this, the WASH sec cluster in Sudan has actually developed this online dashboard that is available. Um, you can uh, look it up online, but um, it uh, details exactly um, some of their WASH, uh, their COVID responses and how they've expanded WASH, um, particularly in the last year. Um, and WASH partners in total have responded to about 700, over 700,000 individuals with um, access to water issues, um, over 200,000 with sanitation services, and over 1 million with hygiene interventions. So they were still able to um, actually incre uh, expand their services um, across the country. Um, and some of the initial excesses, successes included a reliance on existing response protocols. Um, the staff that we talked to um, described uh, how COVID-19 was not too dissimilar from other WASH-related illnesses, so they were able to um, translate some of those existing protocols to COVID-19, um, and that obviously includes the uh, emphasis on hand washing and hygiene services. Um, they also received increased funding because uh, governments worldwide had uh, made a concerted focus on um, WASH services in order to mitigate the pandemic. Um, and this allowed um, organizations like UNICEF and UNHCR to upscale their responses. Um, and then the third um, is this adaptability. Um, they were able to innovate um, as the, as the pandemic unfolded, um, they moved away from using communal facilities and started implementing interventions on a household basis in order to decrease uh, overcrowding. Um, they had high, they used to have hygiene promoters go door to door um, and instead opted for mass communication by using microphones outside. Um, and they actually also increased community input um, because of restrictions on staff mobility um, due to COVID-19 lockdowns. Um, UNHCR actually uh, appointed community um, community members to uh, liaison between um, UNHCR and UNICEF and the community in order to disseminate information about the pandemic. So that actually allowed them to in, uh, include a greater community response. Um, and as for challenges to resilience building in Sudan, we the staff we talked to discussed um, several, several things. Um, like firstly, the lack of emergency stocks. So when it first hit, there was obviously a lot of panic and people weren't prepared and the, when people were panicked, there were a lot of resources that were bought and used up and um, this caused like a shortage of the PPE at the beginning. So supplies were a huge, a huge, huge challenge. Um, and there really weren't enough wash facilities even for normal circumstances. Um, and then for decreased internal capacities, uh, staff had increased fear around the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, most of the UNHCR staff weren't well experienced and were tense about coming into contact with COVID. Um, uh, they were also dependent on the online trainings that were organized by HQ. So it was just a lot of um, virtual and um, lack of in-person um, uh, service providing. Um, additionally, there was stigmatization around COVID-19 and misinformation, like and like a lower uh, community response. So there was the there was there needed to be a, a larger community buy-in around COVID response protocols, which did not happen. Um, and then for poor information networks, there was a weak information system in Sudan, leading to poor data around COVID cases and deaths, and also um, um, less information being spread around as well. So the masses. Um, um, and as for limitations and moving forward, so when, uh, as we were conducting our interviews and like looking for people to um, 
conduct interviews with, there's just a limited number of individuals and organizations that are actually currently working in Egypt and Sudan on the ground and um, working with um, providing wash uh, services. Um, and there's even a smaller amount that we were actually able to connect with and uh, interviewed with us. Um, and just adding on to that, interviewing employees of like the humanitarian actors meant that it's likely, you know, they're a bit biased and participants might not want to be overly critical of their organization that they are a part of. Um, and lastly, there there is a lack of community input in our research, meaning that our research solely relies on information provided to us from the international humanitarian actors. Um, and also, like, um, as we all may have noticed, but um, our research mostly right now is on Sudan and we've finished uh, collecting data for, for Sudan's, um, uh, looking at Sudan, but we're still in the process of um, collecting data for Egypt. Um, and we just wanna end by acknowledging our advisor, Dr. Erica Weintel, who's a panelist on this um, in this session. Um, she's helped us like tremendously in conceptualizing the project and executing it. And we really could not have done this without her. Thank you so much. Thank you too so much. You know, I have to say that one of the one of one of the things the Environmental Peace Building Association is really committed to is um, integrating youth and 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 the perspectives of youth into all aspects of its activities, supporting people in terms of research and communication and problem solving and practice. And that makes a lot of sense for all sorts of reasons. Um, one of which is that you know, con peace building often takes place in, in in areas where youth are the most significant or the largest demographic, and and certainly youth around the world in every part of the world are looking um, at a decade or two of having to to address significant global challenges. So integrating them into, into the Environmental Peace Building Association, I think has been tremendously successful. And this is a great example of that. And it's great to be able to, and, and if you have any questions, um, please drop them in the chat and we will have time uh, uh, after the next presentation. It's nice to juxtapose youth and that sort of energy and excitement um, to, against uh, uh, the sort of the wisdom and the depth that comes from years of thinking about these problems. And so our second paper um, is, is uh, uh, the product of two people, Erica Weinthal, who's already been mentioned. She's a professor of environmental policy and public policy in the environmental science and policy division at Duke University. She's also vice president of the Environmental Peace Building Association. So, you know, um, she's obviously uh, doing the walk that, she, that we all talk about when it comes to including youth in, the, in these activities. She specializes in global environmental politics and environmental security with an emphasis on water and energy. Um, her current research involves global environmental politics and governance, uh, environmental conflict and peace building, the political economy of the resource curse and climate change adaptation. She's worked in a number of different geographical locations, including Soviet successor, state, uh, successor states, the Middle East, uh, um, South Asia, East Africa, North Africa. She's the author of State Making and Environmental Cooperation, um, which received a number of awards when, when it was first published. Um, she's, a she's edited or co-edited several volumes, including um, Oil is Not a Curse, uh, Water and Post-Conflict Peace Building, and the Oxford Handbook on Water Politics and Policy. Um, her co-author, Jeannie Sowers, is a professor of political science at the University of New Hampshire. Um, currently on leave, lucky you, I think, as the Harold Gr Grinspoon Faculty Fellow at the Crown Center for Middle Eastern Studies at Brandeis. She's a scholar of comparative politics of the Middle East, and her uh, work is focused on political economy, ecology, and state society relations in, in the Middle East and North Africa. Her most recent book is Modern Egypt, What Everybody what Everyone Needs to Know in Oxford University Press that came out in, in 2018, co-authored with Bruce Rutherford. She's also um, uh, the author of Environmental Politics in Egypt and a co-editor of, of uh, The Journey to uh, Tahrir, International Affairs Security, uh, whoops, Revolution, Protests and Social Change in Egypt. Um, they are going to present a paper entitled, and this is a hugely important topic these days, both of these topics are hugely important, the energy health nexus in contemporary conflict. So Erica and Jeannie, the stage is yours. Great, thank you so much, Richard. I'm gonna go ahead and share some slides. Um, hopefully we'll all be able to see them. 
And uh, it was a great pleasure listening to the last talk. I think you guys did a wonderful job. Um, can everyone see the slides okay? Great. Um, so we changed the title of our talk a bit as, as you know, people can do. Uh, so we're talking about a project that we've been doing for a couple of years. Um, and with now we've sort of moved into a new direction to talk about its linkages to public health. And the project that we've been working on looks at protracted conflicts in the Middle East and North Africa specifically, and looks at the targeting of civilian infrastructure by state and non-state actors, both intentionally and unintentionally, and then talks about the sort of reverberating and long-lasting impacts of that. And because those conflicts have been going on for so long, there's now data coming out from the World Health Organization and other monitoring units that is starting to show the specific disease impacts. So the second half of our talk, which Erica is going to give, uh, will actually show some of the data that we have um, drawn from the World Health Organization to talk about some of those linkages. Um, this is a new area of work for us. So I'm really happy that there's a large number of people on this call who probably have as much experience and more experience than we do. So we really look forward to your questions and comments to sort of improve this work going forward, particularly thinking about the linkages between inadequate civilian infrastructure and public health consequences. The major questions driving this project were really to think about what are the costs of war as they play out in civilian infrastructures? And here we think of infrastructures as actually the wash sector, I think really nicely demonstrates, of course, as those uh, um, sort of systems that mediate between the natural physical environment and uh, sort of human activity. And one of the focuses of our research has been looking at the impact on livelihoods, particularly in agriculture and fishing, as some of the sectors that were most clearly targeted in the cases in which we look at. Uh, we, pried, we tried to sort of document the extent of infrastructure destruction by actually compiling a data set of discrete incidences of targeting that draws on both open search media accounts that were done by our students at Duke and at UNH, but also using uh, sort of UN agency collected data and data sets. So we also use ACLED, for those of you who are familiar with it, we use the Civilian Impact Monitoring Project for Yemen. So there's a range of data sets that we also incorporate. Um, our goal here is to contribute to the evidence base about what are the impacts of war on civilian infrastructure, and of course, to sort of help generate and support international and regional debates about making those attacks on infrastructure, um, if you like, less tolerated. Because as we know, they've, uh, international norms have been widely flouted in the recent conflicts. And then our last goal was, which we, should, we hope to have a lively discussion about today, to understand the risks and constraints for environmental peace building. The conflict cases that we've been looking at uh, vary in time period by the sort of intensity and duration of the conflict. Uh, so we have some pieces out on Yemen and the West Bank and Gaza uh, currently, and we're now working on Libya um, and Syria and Iraq. And those are actually gonna come out in a book that if Eric and I ever find the time to write uh, in its entirety, but that's the goal here. Um, just a few quick observations about why infrastructure is so central to public health in the Middle East. Um, in these wars, we've seen them both as objects of violence, and in here we include unintentional and collateral damage, as well as intentional targeting. And we've also seen the weaponization of water, energy, and health infrastructures. And interestingly, of course, uh, we're also interested in, I'm starting to work on um, the politics of reconstruction, in which these infrastructures are actually, of course, hotly contested and sort of are, are actually used in very exclusionary ways, um, as well as a sort of a focus on restoring public public services. Um, I already mentioned this, but it's important to note that the gaps in international law covering the targeting of infrastructure are so huge at the moment that parties to these conflicts have targeted these infrastructures with impunity under a variety of justifications or simply without justification. I think it's important to note that one reason the region is so interesting for these sets of questions is that's highly urbanized. And so it's actually more than 60% is urbanized. And uh, we can go into detail later about places like Egypt where um, classifications of what is urban are actually politically motivated and do not even capture the extent of urbanization going on in agricultural lands. So this creates the systems of infrastructure that were created were part of state building. They were part of extending state sovereignty sovereignty into what were considered peripheral and remote areas. And also the physical geography of the region, of course, means you have to move water over great distances. You have to produce energy and move energy over great distances. And that creates 
new vulnerabilities, as well as um, higher levels of service. So the piece that we have focused, focused on is how does protracted conflict lead not only to immediate destruction, but also uh, these kind of cumulative deteriorations that happen over time, largely as a result of lack of personnel and that they can't get to what they need to to repair, uh, repair um, these systems, but also that most of our conflicts are characterized by various forms of blockades or occupations or sanctions or import restrictions all of which mean that you can't actually repair things once they're destroyed in any reasonable period of time. And I think this is a point that the ICRC in particular has been raising as a challenge for the notion of environmental peace building, which is that there is no country where we're looking at a reasonable or rapid enough repair of essential infrastructure. And therefore the public health consequences are actually gonna be pushed onto future generations. I think this is very dramatically illustrated with the case of lack of water access in Syria. Syria was a middle income country with actually extensive public services before the civil war. Um, and of course, which was also a regional conflict. And so there's a, a very interesting World Bank assessment that went through actually the power, the um, water treatment plants, the sewage treatment plants and the sanitation networks and found that uh, basically there was a fairly large and systemic uh, effect across the country. So I highly recommend that report if you're interested in. Water systems have also been weaponized, particularly as these conflicts sort of ground on. One recent example was in the sort of northeast part of Syria, where essentially Turkey, Turkish backed forces, and then later actually um, other, other parties as well, actually deliberately targeted a pumping station that served over 400,000 people in Hasaka, and then again uh, later on in, in the, the subsequent year. So the point here about this particular example is that most of these systems are targeted multiple times. And again, this is something that the ICRC has documented, which is that they can go in and repair systems, but the public health consequences keep reverberating because these systems are often redestroyed and retargeted. I think most of us are familiar with the sort of collateral damage and reverberating, reverberating effects that happen from when you lose energy in particular. So the problem with energy supplies in the Middle East is that water and sanitation systems, as they are elsewhere, are dependent upon supplies of energy. So whenever there has been interruptions in supplies of energy in these conflicts, we've had immediate and cascading effects um, in the sort of overflow of sewage, which you can see in this picture is actually Gaza City in, in the height of the 2014 conflict, and the collapse of public health systems that rely upon, of course, reliable electricity, um, and then the spread of disease, which is what we're gonna start to talk about now. Now. Before moving to the specific disease uh, linkages that we want to discuss, I just want to highlight uh, some of our findings uh, for specifically for Yemen, just to give an example of the kind of work that we've been doing. So the data set is geolocated and it's done by, um, by year, as you can see. And one of the interesting findings was that both um, for the West Bank and Gaza and uh, for Yemen was that the agricultural system as, as, as such was actually the most frequent target of Air, air strikes, artillery shelling, um, sort of uh, a range of sort of ways of targeting infrastructure that we didn't expect. We expected to see oil pipelines and refineries and sort of big centralized systems. But actually in Yemen, the extent of the, especially the air campaign by the Saudi coalition, but also by the Houthi forces and other parties to the conflict really has gone after farms in particular and fisheries in a different, and, and fishing boats. So, so this kind of small scale, but very intense um, attacks on agriculture were, were quite surprising to us. And of course, we all know that one related consequence of this infrastructure targeting combined with economic sanctions, blockades, and the collapse of the economy in so many ways, and the reorientation of the economy to a war economy has, of course, uh, induced much greater levels of hunger in Yemen than were historically present, and there are pockets of famine uh, in Yemen. So why do basic water services matter for health and for public health? Obviously, we've seen that as conflict intensifies, cholera outbreaks also intensify. Uh, in Yemen, it was the largest recorded episode of cholera, although there have certainly been other severe instances in South Sudan and in Haiti. And importantly, even when conflicts come to a formal end or are, are negotiated, 
we see that the risk of dying from exposure to infections lingers. And so that post-conflict deaths, as in the DRC, can often be uh, sort of much greater than we might expect. And they certainly get very little media coverage and very little international pressure once the supposed war has ended. So I'm going to turn it over to Erica in a moment. These are This particular chart is the um, reported cases of cholera re um, reported by the World Health Organization. At the point that we were drew these charts, we could only get from 2016 total. But I think it shows you that although cholera is endemic to, Ye to parts of Yemen and actually parts of the season, depending on the rainy season and which part of the country you're in, it severely started rising in 2011, uh, which was the height of the sort of revolutionary upheav upheaval against uh, Saleh. And then it actually in 2016, it goes down. But if we could show the data from 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, that's when the cholera epidemic really intensified. So Erica, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay, and I will tell you when to advance slides. Hopefully this will work. Um, thank you, Jeannie. That was um, great laying out the, almost the entirety of the project. Um, and I will just add, um, you know, part of the motivation for this research has been that for so long, the work in environmental conflict um, has focused um, almost solely on civilian, or I should say the work in conflict studies, not environmental conflict, has focused um, on civilian deaths and the targeting of civilians. And our motivation was has been to understand what happens when you take out um, civilian infrastructure, environmental infrastructure, or target agricultural land or fisheries. Um, what does that mean both in the short term and long term for livelihoods, for human health? Um, and also, you know, questions that Hadil and Sama talked about resilience um, within communities. And, um, you know, part of this, though, is, you know, trying to understand um, these long term impacts on human health is really difficult. And so we're, we welcome any suggestions on how to um, measure both the short term and long term um, impacts on human health because it's not as easy to count as you can count body deaths. Um, and it's often through, you know, different, um, it could be because um, a power plant was taken out as Jeannie demonstrated that then leads to water treatment systems not functioning or having, you know, wastewater flooding a city. Um, one of the things that we do see in many of these countries, and, you know, this is a slide of, um, Leishmaniasis um, reported in Libya is the resurgence of different types of parasitic diseases. And um, in many of these you know, protracted conflicts, and much of this has to do with, as Jeannie noted, many of the conflicts are in urban environments. And so, or you have people moving from one place into an urban environment. Um, so you have overcrowding among internally displaced peoples. You have lots of rubble. Um, that have allowed for um, outbreaks of diseases such as leishmaniasis. Um, it is often caused by sand flies. And UNICEF, when we had conversations with different um, organizations in our field work, noted, um, I'll move from, well, you can see this in Libya, which is had, um, in recent years, um, next slide, primarily in places like Syria and Iraq, there have been outbreaks too. And I, I want to note for those of you who've read Peter Hotes's book on vaccine diplomacy, part of what he um, does is also talk about this confluence of conflict and public health um, um, outbreaks due to you know collapse of the public health system, um, migration, the confluence with conflict, and so leishmaniasis is one of these diseases that we're seeing more and more in conflict affected um, countries. It is. Um, apparently very painful. Um, we're also seeing, thank you, um, you know, when we're talking about vaccine diplomacy, conflict interrupts the ability to administer vaccinations. And we're, um, so we're seeing, you know, we're seeing the, um, the breakdown in the ability to administer polio vaccines in many parts of the Middle East. And this is a part of the world that did very well um, with health indicators up until the conflict starting in 2011. 
So we're seeing, you know, um, a regression in health indicators. Um, next slide. Okay. So I'm going to start concluding because I think it would be great to have a discussion. Um, and, you know, linking this to the um, environmental peace building um, conversation, looking at the role of environment in post-conflict peace building, one of the crucial areas is thinking about the restoration of um, basic services as part of um, post-conflict peace building. What we see um, you know, in many parts of the Middle East, this is work that Jeannie and I have done with another colleague, um, Neda Zawahari, that when we studied the Millennium Development Goals earlier, um, the Middle East did really well in expanding access to clean water and sanitation. Um, but in conflict-affected countries, again, we see development in reverse, we see this regression, and we're seeing this too in the Middle East which had been really um, at the forefront of expanding access to water and sanitation. And so part of um, you know, the um, reconstruction efforts, um, in humanitarian development efforts at war's end is the restoration of basic services or um, trying to keep them functioning um, in the midst of conflict, which, be, which is increasingly common given that these conflicts are not are protracted. And so having to think about what happens, you know, in our work, we think about, okay, what happens after a water system is targeted? You know, what does reconstruction look like? And in many cases, it's not rebuilding a water treatment plant. Again, it's trying to maintain something knowing that it may be targeted again. So we see cycles of repeated targeting in many of our conflicts that we study. Um, next slide. Um, yeah, bringing this all together, um, yeah, it affects the entire conflict cycle when we look at water, um, you know, health infrastructure, um, you know, both um, that increasingly infrastructure is being weaponized, it's being targeted, but it's also critical for reconstruction rebuilding. Um, and we really need to look at the nexus of infrastructure and look at how they're all coupled together because of these links to health um, and disease and mal malnutrition and also linkages to migration and displacement and how that um, contributes to many of these negative health outcomes that we continue to see across the Middle East. And one cannot overlook the role of governance um, in these conflicts. And lastly, that you know, um, climate change is going to, is is already, but will continue to exacerbate uh, many of these health and environmental impacts that we're seeing um, in the conflicts that we're studying in the Middle East. And I think that is it. Yes, thank you. Well, uh, so thanks to everybody for two, I think really fascinating and also important um, presentations on really sort of cutting edge topics that are critical going forward. And now to sort of move into reacting to these two presentations, we're gonna start with our discussant, Stephanie Martinez, who's a doctoral student in urban and environmental planning and policy at the, in the school, uh, school of Social Ecology at the University of California, Irvine. Prior to starting her doctoral studies, she worked at EcoHealth Alliance, as a behavioral risk research coordinator. She also served as a community health education volunteer with the Peace Corps in Cameroon. She received her bachelor's degree in international development studies in Spanish from UCLA and a master of public health and a master's and a master of international affairs from Columbia University. And Stephanie, I know you've, you have a few questions, comments, and so it is all yours now. Thank you. So it was such an honor to learn about the work that Hadil Sama, Dr. Sowers, and Dr. Weinthal are doing, and to be invited to add in some of my own reflections. I do have to admit, I was a little bit nervous when I was initially asked. I'm a relative newcomer to environmental peace building, but an enthusiastic one. And the Middle East and North Africa region is not one that I am very familiar with, but in reading the work um, and listening to what our speakers had to share today, I found that to not be a deal breaker in really getting what was being shared. And what stood out to me so much in the work of our speakers was how 
expansive its topics were and how it hit on so many different global health challenges that I suspect most people on this Zoom are invested in from water access to health services access to the movement of people and how all of these intersect with the environment. And as we are at the end of our second conference, I really wanted to appreciate how so many of the topical and thematic thorough lines of the conference from data needs to the health impacts of displacement were present in the research that our speakers presented today. So speaking from my positionality in the US, uh, in my limited experience with global networks, I've seen how easy it is to think about how these huge global environmental and health challenges, um, how it's easy to think of them as sort of over there problems, particularly in conflict settings. But even in this context, they really aren't just over there problems. And for me, while I was processing the work, it was helpful to draw parallels with new stories and trends that I hear about happening around me, particularly with communities who are in very real conflict with the institutions around them. And it helped me to understand the magnitude of the public health and environmental impact of conflict and how it's 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 inescapable and it's here in all of our lives and that's sort of the lens through which i want to share some of my reflections so a point that was made really early on in dr sowers and dr weinballs's work and i'm drawing from uh the article that undergirds their presentation today as well as well as hadil and samad's presentation um, is about the importance of systematic data collection and analysis. And I pulled this quote from the article where it discusses how conflicts are poorly documented, particularly their economic impact, and how this ultimately leads to inadequate consideration in policymaking, which then has an overall impact of the public not really understanding the severity of the situation. And this matter of data invisibility really reminded me of the ongoing challenges faced by indigenous communities here in the US in being respectfully and meaningfully seen and counted. And I have here a screenshot of a New York Times article talking about the climate change impact for indigenous communities in the US. And a parallel that really struck out to me was how, despite being vulnerable to flooding, fewer than 50 of the 574 recognized tribes take part in the flood insurance program, partially because only a third of them have ever had flood not been done by the federal government. And then zooming out from that a little bit of the almost 60K properties that have gotten FEMA grants since 1998 in order to prepare for disasters, only 48 of those were on tribal lands. And it really drives home the idea that, especially as researchers and folks who might interact with the policy realm in the context of environmental peace building, visibility in data is such a crucial point. You know, being seen and being counted matters, especially when that sort of data collection is linked with resources that will improve resilience during um, post-conflict settings and especially in the face of climate change. So, Another topic that came up today that really stood out to me were the very immediate health impacts of human movement and lack of movement and how destabilizing it can be to cities and other communities who receive displaced persons, particularly with regards to disease spread and health services. And this is something we're all going to have to face as we see more and more the impacts of climate change on human, human movement across the world. And it immediately drew my mind to the situation that we see playing out in Kiribati. So um, Kiribati is an island nation in the Pacific Ocean. And unfortunately, when you Google and look at the news about which countries are really feeling the full brunt of climate change right now, Kiribati is almost always there. In particular, I thought about its current challenges because the country is seeing huge movements of people, particularly into the capital city. And models show that by 2055, which is not very far away, internal migration is expected to increase by 100%, uh, which includes a population increase in the capital itself alone of over 70%. 
Um, and they did a survey, I believe, and almost a fifth of the people indicated that climate change had been a reason for their migration. And I see so many parallels between this and the findings shared by Sama and Hadil and potential magnifications of this through Dr. Sowers' point about the weaponization of water. This is extremely consequential from an immediate public health standpoint. Water availability, which was already limited, is going to be even more compromised as it struggles to meet the needs of the growing population. Um, and all we need to think of to get the severity of this crisis is also the COVID-19 pandemic and how crucial water availability has been for us in saving off infections. And as we know, water is life, water is everything. We unfortunately have too many examples to choose from in the US of how political and other structural forces have compromised safe water accessibility, particularly for underserved communities. And I have a peer screenshot from another New York Times article, um, I'm kind of a fan, uh, reporting on the experienced and perceived long-term impacts of the Flint water crisis, where if you'll remember residents were failed by their public authorities and being able to access safe water. And it's now that we're starting to see the health impact of things like lead exposure in children and their educational outcomes, which is just to say that water and the conflicts around water in different circumstances, it touches all of us. Um, and it was really great to learn about the work of Saman Hadil in this area to understand the scope of water accessibility across, um, across the MENA region, specifically today in Sudan. Um, what we could learn um, about through the lens of the COVID-19 pandemic, and then going back to the idea of data, how much the global, the global community, which includes us, has to learn about from the perspectives and the work of practitioners who are actually sort of out there um, in the thick of it doing this work. And it really also made me think about how sometimes our most important challenges need a visual touch point that everyone can relate to. And for environmental peace building and public health, I really can't think of anything more universal and more salient than water. And something else that really struck me, particularly in the article, was about how our givens aren't permanent. And by that, I mean the successes that we have on hand can disappear at the turn of a dime for a variety of reasons. In the context of conflict, we have um, the example of vaccine campaigns getting disrupted. And in this quote that I pulled, which I'm glad that I did because we talked about it already earlier today, um, we saw that uh, the 77% 77 coverage of babies in Yemen for polio dropped by 10 points just over the course of eight years. And it reminded me so much of vaccination broadly, but also, trust in science in the US. You know, what many here probably couldn't fathom being under threat a few years ago, very, very much is today. And going back to the theme of data collection, the nuances of this rollback in sentiment is really only quantified when we collect data carefully. And I have um, a screenshot here of polling data from the Pew Research Center, looking at trust in medical scientists and scientists that are not medical scientists from um, January 2019 to November 2020. And when we look at US adults as a whole, and those are the purple bars, the numbers seem to rise and plateau more or less over the course of the pandemic. But when we look even more closely by factors such as party leanings, we see opposite trends. And I bring this up because it shows how thorough and holistic our approach to addressing any aspect of peace building and public health needs to be. Even the wins that we think we have can be lost because of events and forces that we can't necessarily predict. And data, good, strong, robust, nuanced data is important to see that. And the last parallel that I wanna draw is how important it is to consider how people move how people don't want to move and the forces that push them away or keep them in place. And there's a really poignant line in, um, in the article again, where it says the intersecting pressures of hunger, conflict and climate change on human security are even greater when people cannot escape changing conditions. And going back to the example of indigenous communities in the US, we see this, we see this so clearly. 
Uh, drought has compromised water in parts of Navajo Nation, so much so that water is turning brown, wells are running dry, and areas of the nation are also seeing really, really dramatic environmental changes with local animals disappearing as the water goes, vegetation dying, and the animals that do stay are having less and less to eat. And as a result, the public health is compromised, food security is compromised, biodiversity is compromised. And I would also add that cultural ties and traditions, including those tying people with nature in a way that is inherently protective are also compromised. It's a different context somewhat to what was presented today, but I really think that it is the same story. And my overall take from our speakers is brilliant work is that we have to have an eye towards intersections and intersectionality of um, global challenges when working with public health within the framework of environmental peace building. It's not enough to just focus on water access. It's not enough to just focus on health services access. All of our work has to be done with an eye, and hopefully more than just an eye towards the threads that tie and packs together. So food security, conflict, climate change, community empowerment, public health. And public health impacts are acutely felt in settings of conflict and post-conflict, but these are also stories that we see touching every corner of the globe, including here in my own backyard in the US. And with that, I wanted to thank our brilliant speakers for sharing um, the work that they're doing. And I have up here a menu of questions that I'd love to pose to the speakers, but I actually also want to pose these questions to the audience that we have here with us today. You know, we are a group of practitioners, and we're also a group of students, and conferences are supposed to be collaborative learning spaces. So the questions that I have, they're really about your perspectives, your experiences, and your opinions. Um, first, what is your sense of local perspectives towards the areas of greatest public health concern, um, specifically in post-conflict settings in the regions that you're working in? Um, so from your work and your conversations with other scientists, but also with community members, what are they pointing to as the things that we as a global research and a global practitioner community should be paying attention to? Um, then what are your thoughts on how NPACS is currently being considered or ignored among global health initiatives and institutions? And if you feel that it is not being appropriately focused on, where do you see opportunities for sort of our multilateral partners to build more consideration? My third question is whether WASH is just a useful case study through which we can understand the intersection of peace and public health or if there's something intrinsic about water and hygiene infrastructure that warrants us elevating it as a particular asset to be researching and um, getting funding to. And then my last question, I'm so, so happy that we have so many students on the call, particularly undergraduate students. So I'm wondering what in your view are areas within our field that could use more scientists and more scientific investigation? And what are some of the new questions that we should be posing? And then within that, it's not on the slide, but maybe a sub question for Saman Hadil. If you were to build a continuation of your research, I know your, your research is ongoing, but if you were to um, build sort of a V2, what are sort of additional questions that either you would have wanted to ask to the stakeholders who you already talked to or who are other folks that you would want to talk to to get more information? Sort of like, what are the gaps that you saw in terms of the research question? So, because I, I hate it when people do it to me, I don't want to put any one any one speaker on the spot. But maybe if someone is particularly moved by any of these questions, you can jump in and um, answer and get the ball rolling. Thank you. All right. Well, let me say that um, I think you have a few terms to discuss, and I, I think it's really <laughs> important that people. You know, one of the wonderful things about this type of conference is the opportunity to listen and then to, you know, reflect on those findings, those arguments in terms of your own position in the world, wherever you are. So it is this, this you know, we are trying to share lessons learned, share insights and so on. So, so you got to a good start. And between your questions and the questions taking shape in the chat room, we have enough material already for the next half hour. But let me just give our, our, our presenters a couple of minutes to, in case they want to respond to the discussant at all. <laughs> 
And I don't know, um, I don't want to put you on the spot, Jeannie. Okay, we'll start off with Jeannie and, and Erica and then um, uh, Sama, if, uh, if, if, uh, if you have a, a question. Um, and your co-author, is, is she still on? Yes, Hadil is yeah, here. Right here, Hadil. <laughs> the reason I don't see her on my screen. But okay, yes, Jeannie. So that would be great. I was thinking, Stephanie, thank you so much. That was just so helpful. And actually, you really helped me rethink some of the connections uh, to other parts of the world. And I really appreciate that. That was just fabulous. So I just wanted to respond to your first question about local perspectives. Then I was going to hand it off to Erica to talk about the sort of international uh, element. And I was hoping that Hadil and uh, Sama would speak to the questions about WASH. So I thought that might be one, one possible distribution of labor. But for local perspectives, the first thing I wanted to say was that your question was about post-conflict settings. And I think one of the points that we really want to stress is that that notion doesn't really hold for most of the places we're looking at. So when we even think about Lebanon today, right, or Yemen, these places have had cycles of conflict for decades. And so we can't really say that it's post-conflict. And that's true for Iraq, it's true for Libya, it's true for Yemen, so it's true for the West Bank and Gaza. So there's no sense really in which we have some clearly defined conflict cycle. And I think that's why we've been trying to talk about protracted conflict. And that's actually why your parallels in a way to the Native American communities in the US are so profound for me, right? Because we were talking about unfolding processes of exploitation and dispossession that in this in that case go on for centuries. So it's really your your point is really important about this thinking about the temporality and time scale. So with that caveat let me just say what I understand um, some of the local concerns to be. Um, I've done a lot of field work in Israel, I mean, in, in Egypt, and uh, some in Palestine, and we've been talking to a lot of different humanitarian organizations based outside who rotate in and out of these countries as well. Um, and I would say that a lot of the concern is around what you would think of as these basic services, and that's why we ended up focusing on them. One we didn't talk a lot about today is solid waste. So probably the thing that makes these places most difficult to live in is lack of adequate solid waste treatment and collection and uh, the sort of open burning that comes with it. So poor air quality and air pollution, along with lack of solid waste, are, are two of the most pressing concern in every single Middle Eastern city that I've ever been to. Um, so that would be the first thing. And, and those also suffer in war. And we have had less uh, data on this. We've had less chance to focus on it, but it's very, very important. Um, but the other concern is really lack of access to electricity and to fuel, because it's one thing when you lose access to centralized electricity networks. But what you really see is that people cope in all sorts of ways. And so many, many organizations and, and households will share communal generators. But in Iraq and in uh, Lebanon and in certainly much of Syria, it's actually in Yemen today, especially, it's impossible to pay for the fuel that you need to run a generator. And then these ad hoc mechanisms are coping generate a whole other second order public health effects, which are incredibly serious. So running the generators generates a huge amount of local air pollution and noise pollution that is incredibly significant because it's actually right near where people are living. So again, there's these second and third order effects and I think they're very well documented. But to get back to your question about local perspectives, and there's some a question in the chat I'm just going to address in this context about contestation and what did I mean by contestation about repair and reconstruction. So who gets services back and what type of services they get and where they are provided by something like regimes that are fighting for their existential survival is a political question. And because these conflicts are not simply civil wars, but regional and internationalized wars, it means that the question of what will get built and for whom and whether that's centralized or decentralized, whether it relies on oil and gas or renewables, all these things become part of the political economy of these internationalized conflicts. So to make that concrete, when the Saudi coalition and the UAE propose investments into parts of Yemen, it's the parts of Yemen that they have under their control and that they are then trying to make attractive for displaced populations. When the Syrian regime prioritizes where it, re it repairs infrastructure, it is in cities that it has helped to ethnically and sectarianly cleanse. So what I meant by this contestation is that these are inherently political processes precisely because our conflicts are not resolved in any, in any real sense. 
So that was a very long-winded answer, but I found your question so provocative. And thank you so much for those really, really helpful comments. Fantastic. And, and Erica, did you want to add something before we go to Hadil and, and Salah? I will just say a few words about the second question, which is less provocative, <laughs> um, which, you know, just is about, you know, any thoughts on environmental peace building as incorporated into global health. Um, and essentially, I think this is where we've seen lots of progress, probably not enough, but um, we are seeing increasingly um, organizations like UNICEF that often takes the lead on um, water and sanitation in um, conflict affected countries, um, carrying out, you know, writing reports, looking into the issue of um, the targeting of water and infrastructure and what does that mean for their delivery of humanitarian assistance, what it uh, means for reconstruction. Um, they had a series of reports out on water under fire. And so um, the challenge for many of um, these global health institutions or um, humanitarian institutions is just the timing, the time frame in which they work, um, because they don't have the ability to sit and build the databases, collect the data, and do the tracking of targeting of infrastructure, even though they witness it on a daily basis. But they are being forced to respond and make, you know, to ensure that people have access to clean water and proper sanitation. Um, so this is where I think we, we're seeing some interesting um, you know, collaborations taking place or recognitions that you know, academics can do some of this tracking, NGOs can do some of this tracking, building the evidence base, the database, which then can be used to hold um, political or political militias, governments, um, militaries accountable for um, these, you know, the destruction of infrastructure that harms civilians, that targets civilians. And, you know, the only other thing I would say too is, you know, also um, it's, I guess I'll, I'll stop there. I'd rather have Hadil and um, Sama answer and then we can come back around for another round of questions. You bet. And so Hadil or, or Sama, do you want to take on some of the questions here? Yeah, I guess I can kind of elaborate a little bit more about like is WASH a case study or for a uh, increasing like inclusion of water and hygiene infrastructure. Um, I think that what we found in our study is that um, you cannot talk about resilience building without looking at cultural sensitivity or conflict sensitivity. And so when we were trying to identify challenges or success stories within humanitarian actors interventions in Egypt and Sudan, we had to also look uh, into whether or not they addressed certain um, consequences of the conflict and also like catered towards um, the cultural norms in Egypt and Sudan. And um, I think that like in Dr. Weinthal and Dr. Sauer's research, they talked a lot about second and third order effects. And what um, studying WASH allowed us to do is kind of look at, you know, how does access to water impact sanitation and hygiene infrastructure, um, which then leads to um, public health consequences, such as uh, waterborne illnesses. And we were able to kind of map those of impacts in a systemic way. Um, and I think that's really informative for humanitarian actors working in the region to understand um, where they need to intervene or increase um, resources. Um, and I think that Sama, Sama can kind of talk more about also this idea of just including more local perspectives, because I think we can touch that on that a little bit more. Right. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, as Stephanie said, like, if we could, like, I guess, add on to our research or if we were redesigning it, I think one of the biggest things would be to have include more local voices. It's just like it was just really hard. I think we found a couple of organizations um, in Egypt, but it was just really hard to get in contact with them. Um, and then additionally, even like including um, government initiatives, like there are like the National Water, the National Ministry of Water, and then like the National Research Center um, on Water in Egypt as well, like both are doing a lot of work when it comes to increasing access to wash. 
And so, you know, although they're not like humanitarian actors, it would be interesting to see like their perspective and their take on handling COVID and also like looking at cooperation between humanitarian actors and, um, and like government initiatives as well in country. There are, that's fantastic. And there are quite a few sort of questions, observations, comments in the chat. So I'm gonna just go through some of them and lay them out for everybody. Um, a couple of people have asked, by the way, if you are willing to share your particular parts of your presentation or your entire presentation, that I leave up to you, whether you wanna put it into the chat or do it at your own discretion uh, or not do it at all. But that question has come up uh, and I, I'm sure we can link to the paper uh, that, that, that Stephanie talked about. Um, so a couple of questions, uh, and I'm not going through them in any particular order, but you know, since the agricultural sector has received the most incidents, do you think it's the most essential sector for citizens and for you know promoting peace building? Because it isn't one that we have historically thought of that much compared to say the mining sector uh, and and you know other other or, or coastal areas and so on. Um, so I throw that question out to begin. Anybody want to? And I think obviously that that came from Jeannie and Erica's paper. Sure, I'm, I'm happy. I think it's a great question, and it's it's one I've been thinking about, and Erica probably too. Um, I think that agriculture is the nexus of rural livelihoods in so many places that yes, <laughs> it essentially is is essential. And I think these debates have often been misconsidered in the sense that certainly for Syria, the the arguments that have taken place are been you know did rural neglect because of the drought, you know, create conflict. And I think Marwa Daoudi, but also many others have convincingly argued that that's kind of the wrong question to ask. Clearly there was a drought, clearly it negatively affected actually hundreds of thousands of farmers, particularly in the Southeast and Northeast parts of Syria and many thousands of people moved. But to then move to some sort of reductionist account of the outbreak of the 2011 uprising would ignore all the political grievances uh, and the different populations that actually, that actually rose up instead. So I think you're right. I think we need to think about agriculture in terms of lost livelihoods, in terms of actually increasing resilience. And in, in those senses, like how can we make farmers more resilient to these changes? And I'll just say, um, since Egypt has come up several times that one of the puzzling things has been that known policy solutions from other parts of the world, say crop insurance for smallholders in the face of climate change have not actually been extended to the extent that you would expect in countries like Syria, where over half the population, or in Yemen, close to probably 75%, directly depends on livelihood and agriculture. So why have Middle Eastern regimes been so slow to uptake on policy solutions that are not perfect by any means, but certainly could have helped build some resilience? And, and I think that's a really important question that then has to do with political power. Uh, there's other regimes where the agricultural lobby itself, as in Jordan and Israel, is actually an, a, a problem for dealing with water and environmental peace building because they claim more than their fair share. So uh, it really depends on the economy of the country in question, but I think you're right that agriculture is, is essential and, and probably should get more attention. I'll just add a yep. bit, but I'm gonna go a little bit broader. Um, and just earlier today, there was a great panel um, where the ICRC was, you know, um, Jules was talking about some of the ICRC's work in having to help restore irrigation systems to um, providing crop um, drought res res resilient seeds. And this notion that increasingly because of climate change, we're seeing um, resilience systems break down and humanitarian organizations are having to fill the void of what has been traditional development. Um, and so thinking about environmental peace building really throughout the conflict cycle, that this in some ways um, almost is conflict prevention, preventative diplomacy, um, you know, but having to like this notion of humanitarian development nexus is no like, you know, we can't have humanitarian work and development work siloed, especially in many conflict affected countries humanitarian organizations are the only ones on the ground having to think about the importance of livelihoods because you know keeping you know people want to stay on their land and stay um, in their homes and not have to um, relocate 
And you know, for those of us who look at um, post-conflict um, peace building, restoring livelihoods is one of the most important aspects of being able to ensure that um, communities can rebuild. And this is, you know, the agriculture sector in most parts of the world, in many parts of the world, I should say, still employs the largest number of people. So agriculture, um, you know, continues to be an incredibly important sector across, um, you know, the entire environmental peace building conflict cycle. Fantastic. Let me ask one question to each of you, and then I'll try and conclude with by cobbling the rest of the comments together into one large question that will give you an opportunity to make your final statements. Um, one question, do we know anything about, about you know, constraints and restrictions on the, the materials needed to repair wash systems, and I suppose other systems? Um, maybe, I don't know, Hadil or, or some of you, if you've come across that, but are there, are there constraints given the the areas that you're that you're focused on, and if this is not something that's come up, that's fine. Yeah, no. In our research, um, a lot of the interviewees described issues like procuring materials to like expand the number of hand washing facilities or latrines or water taps um, in order to expand wash services. But after the initial COVID shock, um, they were able to um, kind of restore those supplies and build up an emergency stock. So um, those kind of is initial issues were a little bit temporary. But I think that it was um, important to note that where the areas that they were describing were mostly like refugee camps um, and I think places where there wasn't active conflict. Yeah, just to follow up on what Hadil said, I see, I think. Um, the question in the chat asks about international restrictions on imports because they're dual use items, right? So chlorine or, or these things. And I think that's exactly right that what Hadil said, I think in the conflict areas, there is significant in it and ongoing difficulties in procuring even basic items. And I think historically we saw that in Iraq and the, under the US sanctions, right? The difficulties in importing anything that was used for public health. But that is crucially important right now in, in particularly in Yemen where the import restrictions they have exception mechanisms that are actually modeled on the Gaza exception mechanism, which is that the UN sets up these monitoring and verification systems. But if you think about it, in a way, those systems, because they're very bureaucratic and they're very complex, they induce systemic delays in delivering essential uh, repair parts, so consumables and actual parts. So in a way, it reifies the system as somehow legitimate. And it doesn't ask the prior more important question from our perspective, which is that import restrictions on things that are being used to repair a water station should not be delayed and they should not be considered dual use. And so I think there's this um, there's a there's a substantial ethical as well as logistical question about whether these exception mechanisms have actually enabled sufficient humanitarian supplies to get in to any of these places. And I would say that the answer is generally not enough in a short enough time period to really have ameliorated these situations in the way that humanitarian actors could have done so had access been easier. So I think the geopolitics of these conflicts, and again, the fact that there have been superpowers involved and the fact that Russia and the US are on opposite sides in many ways, and the fact that Saudi Arabia and Iran are on opposite sides, this is what's creating situations where you can't import the essential things you need uh, to repair these basic services. And that's a that's a, a wonderful answer to this next and another question again sort of speaks directly to something you said Jeannie, and that is about what we know about not just what you know in in terms of the weaponization of water um uh we know about the physical health impacts but do we know anything about the mental health impacts uh, about about those that type of activity or is that an area where we need more data I, i'm sure you might have or anybody might have some comments on that Um, I think we can touch slightly on some of the sure, cultural please. impacts of um, disrupted water services, or in this case, like also the just the impacts of COVID-19. Um, what UNICEF did was rely a lot more on community members to kind of promote hygiene practices and social distancing. And um, one of the ways they did that was contacting women in South Darfur, um, 
to encourage them to convince their community members to like avoid gathering while drinking coffee, which is really intrinsic to the cultural um, sphere in that context. So um, I would say that's one way that maybe disrupted access to water or the, also the presence of uh, an infectious disease has disrupted like cultural identity um, and cultural norms. That's a great example. I don't know. Um... You know, thinking mental health expansively as the question does cultural health identity issues, you know, issues of, of, of the sacred and so on. Um, anybody else want to add any? Yeah, I think Stephanie probably actually has thought about a lot about this as well. Um, but I was going to say that when we talk to um, humanitarian organizations working in Jordan with Syrian refugees, it, it became very clear that you know the issues around design of the camps and how were water how was water being provided. You know, they they first thought about doing communal taps, and that was like absolutely not acceptable because Syrian households had had individual taps in the house. So they they quickly realized that their models that they were importing of the refugee camps from sub-Saharan Africa. And again, even the assumption, right, that it was that it was okay to do some of these things in other places, I think is a very problematic set of assumptions. Uh, so I'm not endorsing them, but I'm simply saying that one of the things that the humanitarian organizations kept saying was, uh, well, they have, they, the Syrians, have these expectations. And it was clear that we were going to have to adapt. Uh, we couldn't just impose them. Um, so I think there's, it's a very profound question about also people's sense of dislocation and loss. And I don't think we've addressed this. I think Hadil really captured that well. Um, and I think it is this hugely understated part, right, of how do people live with conflict and the sense that somehow the conflict ends, it doesn't end for them. And so I, I really appreciate that question. I, I think that people live with the consequences of conflict for the rest of their lives um, and, and in both in their physical bodies and in the sort of way they think of themselves in their community. Anyone else? So, so we have seven minutes, I guess, left, and and uh, you know, a lot of focus of this conference and of thinking generally is on sort of the coevolution of things like urbanization and development on the one hand, and climate change and nature loss on the other hand, and you know, the ways in which mounting stress in one or shocks in one affects the other, and vice versa, and and really, you've added a. A, a critical other dimension, the way the, way the, the co-evolution between those processes in conditions of protracted conflict, where we're getting this sort of feedback between the conflict of itself and the ability to adapt, to innovate, to repair, to restore, and so on. And, and this sort of suggests, and I, and another comment, the need for longitudinal work as well, because we get these sort of snapshots of a place, and that tells us something interesting, but we also want to see how this plays out over over time, um, and that to me seems, especially the sort of arguments you've, you've all made, been making, lend itself to, to some element of, of sort of a longer view from a research perspective. So we see how these things play out, like COVID, on these systems. Um, now, that ca I'm trying to capture a little bit of, of, of the thinking in the, in the chat, but, but really, let me just lay that out as a sort of question, like, where do we go from here as researchers and practitioners? What can we do coming out of this conference on these sorts of issues, which I think you've persuaded everybody are critically important and do not have not received the attention that they deserve. Um, and then of course, any other final departing comments you wanna make are fine. And maybe we'll just sort of go in the order that we started. So I will um, ask Hadil and, and Sama to each take a minute or two to sum up or you know their parting message. And then I'll turn to, to uh, Jeannie and Erica. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, I really appreciate that. And I think one of the questions in the chat did pose, you know, do uh, can we do this research over a longer perspective to see how WASH protocols have changed um, over time, especially as like more information comes out about COVID. And I think that is a huge thing for us revisiting some of the protocols or response mechanisms that these humanitarian actors have implemented and beginning to get an understanding of what do they think their lessons learned are. Um, and we got a little bit of that in our initial interviews, but it would be interesting to revisit that so that we can get a longer term or uh, vision or view of 
what is going on. Um, but I think a huge thing for us, uh, like Sama had mentioned earlier, was including more community voices um, and getting an understanding of how these interventions are playing out from the community perspective. And um, UNICEF did do a study um, trying to understand the community response. And I think they are supposed to come out with something soon, but um, it would have been great to hear from like student, local Sudanese people on the ground, particularly people who are displaced also in addition to like flooding or other causes, um, other crises that are um, going on there. So yeah, I think that's like a huge thing. Um, but I, in sum, I think it was, it's been rewarding to systematically map out how we can build resilience among humanitarian actors working there and kind of getting an understanding of how these effects cascade um, down to the public health impacts. That's a great answer. That's a great comment. Um, Sam, do you want to add anything? Yeah, um, as Hadil said, like I think the biggest one of the biggest things that like would be just getting that local response, that, that local input. I think um, when it comes to like doing work, especially like in another country or like in an area that we aren't in, like getting input from people who are actually there and living that situation is the most important, and making sure we're addressing their needs. Um, so I, yeah, I think getting that local input is the most important, and then. Um, I'm oh, sorry, I lost my train of thought there for a second. Um, like, but a, a quick example to that, that maybe I'll just end with like a little story is that one of the um, uh, experts that we talked to discussed how like wadu or ablution um, is like a super common practice in Egypt and Sudan where they are majority Muslim countries. So like a lot of the hygiene practices like hand washing were um, a little bit easier to communicate to the community because they're already practicing a certain level of um, sanitation and hygiene. So that was just an example where like that cultural piece or that those local perspectives are really important when thinking about what interventions are needed or necessary. Fantastic. Um, let me just give the last, uh, uh, Ginny and, and Eric have done this a million times, but let me give you each a minute to make your final comments too. So I just, the question of what should be done is always the hardest, um, but I think it's a, the most important question in a way. So one thing I'll say is I think that intermediary civil society organizations that try to advocate to address some of the most important problems that have been revealed in these protracted conflicts deserve a lot more uh, support from academics in terms of building the evidence base, but also in terms of actually styles and forms of advocacy. And this is something I certainly struggle with. I think none of us have a lot of time. So the question is, how do we sustain our, our sort of professional commitments, our familial commitments, but also our public engagement commitments? Um, I will just say that for, to give an example, a concrete example, um, the, there's an international kind of network and campaign going on trying to limit the use of explosive weapons in populated areas. And in our research, it's, it's absolutely clear that it's these weapons that have been the most important factor in destroying civilian infrastructure. And so there's these, you know, sort of networks of advocacy organizations that are trying to engage at both the domestic level, that is to get militaries to change their behaviors. And then at the international level, in this case, to have actually some sort of international agreement, which would lay out norms. Um, and, and, I, and, I, and I think those are important for, for another reason, which is that um, it's great to have local voices, but as the environmental defenders <laughs> panel, uh, I think aptly showed earlier today, uh, it's dangerous for many of these people to speak out about what they're going through or their lack of ability uh, to access water and energy and sanitation. And there was an Iraqi speaker earlier today who just, he absolutely summed it up when he said, you can't talk about water, you can't talk about oil, because those are objects of contention, not just the resources, but the way they are delivered between different militias, all of whom are backed by different states. And I think this is exactly the case. And even in Egypt, you'll get no information from the Ministry of Health or the Ministry of Irrigation on water, because water is a strategic asset and it's an item of dispute with Ethiopia and with Sudan. And so all of our, our, our sort of things that we think we should be able to advocate for in these contexts, each and every one of them can be dangerous for you. And that's why I think there is a role for these kind of aggregate and intermediaries uh, because they are in a more privileged position and we can recognize that it's privileged, but we still need to sort of say, then let's use that, that position and leverage uh, because not always can people on the ground speak about or safely actually advocate for what they need.
Great point. And Erica, the last word goes to you. I know there's other comments and things like that, but the last word goes to you. We're, we're just in the last minute. Okay. Um, <laughs> Jeannie always touches all the important points. So I'm just going to reinforce a few. Um, and I think, you know, what she was um, emphasizing is what often um, humanitarians um, aim for is these deconfliction mechanisms to ensure that critical infrastructure isn't targeted. Um, so on the one hand, I'm going to start at a very high level um, that we need better adher adherence to um, international humanitarian law that protects civilians through the protection of infrastructure and that it is simply off limit to target any water system, any power plant that provides electricity to hospitals. Um, because this is, these are um, incidents that can be easily tracked when you take out a power plant and a hospital loses power. Um, and I think where I want to end is really with the pandemic in many ways that we're seeing increasingly the importance of WASH, the work that Hadil and Salma have been doing um, in ensuring that um, civilians, people have access to clean water, thinking about um, decentralized mechanisms for providing access to clean water. We always think about large scale infrastructure as part of our reconstruction efforts. And it may be that we need um, smaller systems in place, that it could be smaller desalination plants. It could be um, solar, you know, small solar grids that could be provide mobile grids that could provide power. And that this is an opportunity may um, at least to rethink how um, our, you know, what we emphasize in infrastructure construction and the delivery of public services. Um, and then, you know, my last point from all of this work, um, you know, with the, with the pandemic COVID, the provision of wash um, vaccines is to really um, hunker down and just continue to emphasize, um, you know, science. And I think that one slide about, you know, the trust or distrust in science is really important because we're going to need to ensure um, these are, you know, that vaccines are being deployed. So I will stop there. Erica, Jeannie, Hadil, Sama, Stephanie, and everybody attending. Um, thank you so much. I think this was a, a wonderful way to end what has been a fantastic conference. Um, great presentations. Thank you so much. Thank you, Richard, for being, as always, an outstanding chair and moderator. Thank you. And I think we are done. Yes.